Hey everybody, I was recently interviewed for the Wholesale to Millions podcast by the one and only King Kong. He's an influencer in the wholesaler space and I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I had fun doing it. Check it out. Wholesale Community Family, today I got a very, very special guest. He's one of the guys that I look up to um, at my real estate mastermind called Collector Genius. He's one of the, I would say, a stone cold killer hustler. One of the <laughs> biggest players at CG. Um, but let, let me give him a proper introduction. Uh, introductions. He's the CEO of SBD Housing Solutions, has raised over 10 million to invest in multifamily. He has flipped over 1,600 homes all across the U.S. of A. And he has a property management company that currently manages over 650 rentals. You guys, so please put your thumbs together and help me welcome my man, Mark. What's going on, Mark? King Kong, great to be with you, buddy. How are you? <laughs> Dude, Mark, thank you so much for taking time um, to jump on to do this with me, man. But I'm super pumped. I'm super excited um, just to know even more about you, man. Because, uh, you know, just at CG, we're just so like, you know, everyone is just trying to, you know, do so much. It's busy uh, week, right? Dude, it's a busy week. Everyone is trying to network and to, to get in there and get what they need. So uh, just being able to have you sit down and uh, get to deep dive more about you, about your story and what you actually do, man, because you're such a go giver, Mark. Man, I appreciate it. You know, you and, you and I come from uh, similar backgrounds. We both immigrated to the U.S. and are living that American dream, brother. Dang. So, Mark, what? what uh, so where are you originally from? Yeah, so I was born and raised in New Zealand, uh, came oh. over um, at the age of 18 uh, to come to university over here. I was uh, a pretty good little tennis player growing up, Kong, so um, <laughs> came over here um, and uh, played uh, collegiate tennis. Um, luckily, they, they paid for my degree. I got my undergrad. I got my MBA. And um, yeah, after that, I kind of fell in love with real estate. Wow, man. So now, Mark, uh, if you can take us back to the journey of how it was when you uh, like, do you start out working for somebody and then become an entrepreneur? Or... Man, I'm the anomaly, Kong. I'm the guy that actually um, just, <laughs> I was getting my MBA and uh, flipped a house um, and accidentally kind of made made some money. And uh, and I'm like, man, I don't want to go work for somebody else. I'm, I was just young enough and dumb enough to think <laughs> I'm going to go, uh, you know, try and do this myself. And so I took a course on how to buy, again, you got to pay for edu the right education, mm. right? You know that. Mm -hmm. So I paid $5,000 to go down and learn how to buy foreclosures on the courthouse steps. And so from 2001 through 2017, man, I bought about 1,500 homes on the courthouse steps that way. So Dang. Now, Mark, back in 2021 is when you got into real estate. That's right. Yeah, 2001, I flipped my first house uh, right after September 11th, actually, uh, kind of hit. You know how that, that'll uh, put a halt to an advertising deal that I had going on. Uh, we were kind of working in the airline advertising business. And so that got put on hold with September 11th. Um, and we were kind of reeling from that. But I flipped that house and I thought, you know what, let's go and see if we can make a go of this. And ever since then, I've been just slowly flipping houses um, throughout the Kansas City and, and the Midwest. Nice, man. Because the reason I point that out, Mark, because back in 2001, $5,000 in, $5, back in 2001 is worth what? Like 10 or 15 Gs nowadays? Yeah. Oh, totally. And it was, um, you know, something that I didn't even have money at the time, dude. This is not, you know, we talk about five grand now, no big right. deal. But um, at the time, it was <laughs> a lot of money. We didn't have the money. I just put on a credit card. I wanted to make sure that I had the ability to... Um, you know, to, to take care of my family. Um, and so I, I bet on myself, I bet on nice. going in and, um, you know, getting down, getting the education so that I would do things the right way. I did know that mm. I'd read rich dad, poor dad, and yep. I wanted to do it the right way. And so, you know, my thing was, I wanted to make sure that I did things the right way and didn't get in over, you know, kind of get in ahead of myself. Gotcha. Oh, I lost Mark. So uh, we're going to wait for Mark to get back on here. But I think a lot of people that got into a real estate um, have came across a red rich dad, poor dad. If you have if you have never read that book, I highly suggest that you, you should go check it out. Now, you know, your boy King Kong, I'm not so much of a reader. Um, so I do listen to a lot of audiobooks and I watch a lot of YouTube channel. Um, that's kind of how I educate myself. 
Um, but listen, we all learn in different ways. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us are like to listen to audios or read books. Um, but you know, it's, it's all different. So that's why I always tell people that, you know, don't, don't compare your success or, um, your, your progress level with someone else's because we all learn differently. Some of us learn a little bit slower. Some of us learn a little bit faster. Mark, welcome back, bro. Sorry, dude. I, uh, <laughs> we had to, some, some, some bad connection there or something. I'm back. Yeah, you're back, dude. That's all that matters. You're me that easily. <laughs> no problem. So Mark, how, so when you, so, so let's walk the people through how, um, how was it when you flipped your first house? Like how long did it took you? Kind of all that, man. Yeah, I, um, I was lucky. I actually got a referral from a builder um, because, you know, sometimes it's not a, the first one was not a courthouse steps house. Um, the first one was um, one that I got referred to from a builder friend of mine who took one in on trade. Mm. And the builders are not flippers. They just want to sell their house. So they took one in on trade, a new home builder and said, mm. hey, do you want to flip this house? So I, it took me about three months. Um, you know, I kind of went in and did some of the work myself, kind of figured out that that wasn't something I wanted to do. <laughs> Um, but then my next one was, was, uh, much quicker, right? Like I went in, I bought something on the courthouse steps. I actually bought a duplex, moved oh. into that duplex. I rehabbed it and moved in with my wife, uh, which is a great strategy actually Kong. If you can buy a duplex, you move in one half side and rent out the other, you know, and Smart. then your, your tenant's going to pay for your mortgage. So we lived there for a couple of years and then, you know, we never sold it. That house is still actually a part of our portfolio. Wow. So uh, now how much do you bought that property, uh, Mark? We bought that for $33,000 and I still own it today. So we bought it for $33,000 on the courthouse steps. <laughs> um, probably put about seven or eight grand into it because I did the work myself. It was like yep. paint, carpet, appliances, um, countertops, that kind of thing. Put an extra bathroom in the basement. But after that, it was, um, yeah, we lived there for a short amount of time. And now it's probably, you know, that, that duplex is worth somewhere around 140, 150,000. Dang. I mean, I think there's a saying that, you know, I get people ask all the time, Mark, it's like, hey, when is a good time to buy real estate, especially now that the market is hot? Everybody asks, so when is it a good time to buy? And I always say, you know, there's a saying that you buy real estate and you wait. You don't wait to buy real estate because over time it appreciates. 100%. And I understand that everyone has to make money. So if there's mm. full-time wholesalers out there, like, hey, that's great. That's a way to make money. Mm. But remember, for every two or three wholesale deals you do, you've got to start holding on to one as well. And that's one of the Smart. things I did at a very early age. So now I'm 20 years long in the tooth. I've, I've, I'm now 44 years old. I started when I was 24. So over the last 20 years, I've now accumulated, you know, hundreds of rental properties. But I did it because I just bought like, I'd flip three and then I hold one. I'd flip Smart. three and then I'd hold one. So each year I was buying one or two or three houses and then you gain momentum. You start holding on to more and more and more because again, hey, when you make money, Kong, Uncle Sam's there to take that money. You know what I mean? <laughs> so if you make That's money, it's the Uncle Sam's going to come and take 33 or 34% of that stuff. Yep. So if you can hold on, there's great benefit and depreciation uh, to help on tax returns when you are able to hold on to your real estate. Mark, I, dude, I am so glad that you say that because, you know, when I first started too, I was, I didn't know that, right? So, cause nobody told me and uh, I wholesale everything. And at the end of the year, Uncle Sam came and said, hey, hey, King Kong, <laughs> and he took a big chunk away. So a lot of you, you know, even realtors, right? Realtor, wholesaler, we're out there, yep. you are selling houses, but you don't hold any, right? You don't buy yeah. or keep any. And, um, you know, it's in the long, business. yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I like to say, Con, you don't get rich from what you earn. You get rich from what you own. Ooh. Woo. The, more, the more you own, the richer you get, dude. The rich are not those that are making money every year. The rich are those that own land, own real estate, and have cash flowing assets. And that's where, you know, true wealth is born. If you look at the, the richest people in America, they all own land and assets. Damn. Mark, <laughs> bomb are being dropped already. Bomb are being dropped already. So- <laughs> Now, Mark, um, you know, we got a lot of people that are solopreneurs. So how did you merge from being a one man, you know, one man, one, one man show into actually building a team? Yeah, dude. Great question. Um, just for perspective out there, our team now is 30. So we have 30 employees here in Kansas City. But obviously, I started off as a solopreneur. Mm -hmm. The first thing that you need to do when is to eliminate the administrative tasks. So when you are scaling and you're, you're, you've got to have the revenue first. So go, you know, hey, go hustle, grind, do it all on your own. But then try and take the administrative tasks, whether that be a VA or an actual full-time personal and executive assistant, that's always the first way to go. 
from there, it's trying to eliminate the mundane or responsibilities that are pretty easy to do. For me, it was someone that was an acquisition guy on the courthouse steps, right? Because really, when you're going to the courthouse steps, you know, it's not hard. Here's how you buy a house, Kong. You're like this. <laughs> going once, going twice. So you just put your hand up and you buy the house. So you give them a you give them a price, say, hey, don't go above this price, and then go and stand there and put your hand up. So I started having a guy go to the houses, do analysis and, and drive around. And so I had my acquisitions guy, and then I was kind of working on on selling the assets on the back end. And then you have a then you're doing enough volume or okay, well, now I have a dispositions. I'll have someone that's that's listing on and selling all of my houses. Because the other thing with that is you can actually get a realtor who is able to go say, hey, look you be a realtor, go do all of your uh, regular transactions. But I will bring you, you know, let's say you're flipping 30 houses a year, hey, I'll just pay you $1,000 a house. So it's kind of like a base salary of $30,000 for that person, because you're going to give them everything, right? So you're going to give them 30 houses a year, $30,000, which is a good base salary for them. And you give them the volume, and they get, um, you get the discount from uh, working with a realtor. So Again, as you scale and grow, whether that's 1% or $1,000, I mean, it depends on everyone's market. Obviously, in California, $1,000 is nothing when you're selling something for, for 400 grand. But in Kansas City, it would be quite often we'd be selling something for, you know, 100 to 150 grand. So it'd be like, hey, 1% here, and then you get to list the properties and get 3% on the back end or something like wow. that. So you, you just start growing and, and, and scaling and networking. But here's the next step, Kong. So one trick or one thing that will trip you up is thinking that, the people that get you from here, from step A to step B, will also be the ones that get you from step B to step C. And that's one mistake that I made. And we actually presented, you probably in the room when I did the big presentation on the stage in CG talking about hiring a COO. Mm. One of the big steps that, or the missteps I made along the way was thinking, not realizing that some of the people that would help me along the way were not the same people that would get me to that next level. And mm. you just have to be honest and fair with them. And, and I think Sometimes they self-select out. They just can't handle that that extra pace. But sometimes you have to make that tough call and let them go. Wow. Wow. Now, man, so Mark, people always want, like, like you've shared so much, but I know there's someone that's going to ask, so Mark, when, when do I know that I'm ready to start hiring on people? Like, when do you actually know? Yeah, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's, top line revenue based, right? I think mm. top line revenue, and then also your net. I mean, you, you get to the point where you are losing money because you can't expand and scale and do more deals because you are your own constraint. When you become like a funnel, where your business can't grow because you're the bottleneck and you can't get to the deals. Let's say you've got five appointments to go on. Yeah, I can't get to them all today. I just lost that on that deal. You know, your common sense says, man, I'm doing all these administrative tasks. And I'm, I've got to be home by, you know, a decent hour, five or six o'clock, because I want to spend time with my family. Mm -hmm. And so I can't get to all of them during the day. That would be the time that you would um, take it to the next level and start hiring someone to just relieve. So the first step, when I said a VA or an EA, you've got to relieve the administrative duties to maximize your own potential. But once your own potential and your own time is to the point where you are no longer able to keep up with the volume, then you go to the next and, and hire someone that can actually help you operationally. Wow. Wow. Now, Mark, my other questions to you would be um, when you first started out, man, like, ha like how many hours are you grinding a day? Man, that's a good question for, and my for how long like, I didn't see him. You know? yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. The idea that that real estate is the passive game, it's easy. Um, anyone can do it, you know, I think is just like anything. It's the 80-20, man. 80% 80 of the money is made by 20% of the people. And those people, the ones that are out there grinding and hustling. And, and I was that guy. I was dedicated. Um, you know, there's a time in your 20s when it's just that you're running really, really hard to see how good you can get and how much money you can make. And I was, I was very, you know, monetarily driven. I enjoyed, you know, the aspect of trying to go and crush deals and help as many people as we could. So, um, yeah, I, I was a grinder. I mean, I didn't even know the hours of the day. I mean, I was just never not working. You know, I'd come <laughs> home, even when I had young kids, I would come home, you know, be present for a couple of hours where you'd come home and have dinner and put the kids to bed at, a, at you know, with this back when come home at six, put them to bed at eight, and then I'll be back on the laptop, right? And just pounding it out, like researching deals, researching foreclosures, um, you know, trying to set the, you know, get the opening bids coming at the last minute. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, for me, on the courthouse steps, there was a lot of like last minute activity. And that was mm. one of the things that really allowed me to, to get these crazy good deals is because at the last minute, 
there would be an opening bid that would come in at nine o'clock the night before that finally say opening bid of, you know, $50,000 on a house that might be worth 200. It's like, mm. I can't turn that down. It's like, <laughs> no, I can't turn that down. So the next morning I'd have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to go to drive to that house, to check it out, to do my inspections because the auction was at nine o'clock in the morning. But you know what, Kong, there was many times when I was the only one at the auction. So I get it for $50,000. No one even bid it up because there was not enough people that were willing to to hustle and grind and get that done. Man. Now, Mark, I because pe- people, were, you know, always, um, you know, starting out asking work-life balance. So when you f- first started out, man, like, do you really have a work-life balance, Mark, or was just? Dude, so th- that is a complete myth. That is a, com- a work-life balance you can throw out the door. If you want to get anywhere, look, okay, analogy, Tiger Woods. Did he have work-life balance? No, there's no such thing. He was grind- He was all in on golf. You look at anyone, Elon Musk, work-life balance? No, he's been divorced like four times. I mean, Richard Branson, same thing. They, anyone who uh, aspires to be best in class, they, they throw work-life balance out the door and they have to be around a spouse or a partner. Now mm-hmm. I'm proud. I've, you know, 21 years in marriage in June, dude. So Congrats, dude. Yeah, I'm, you know, my wife has put up with me for that long, but <laughs> obviously there are times when, you know, it was strained because I would just work so hard to get to that next level. Right. And she was a nurse who always worked for someone else her whole life. And so she mm-hmm. didn't understand that grind where, you know, she could just walk out the door and leave right. her job and it would just be there. But once, you know, we, you, there's a time when you have to address that with your spouse and realize, Hey, look, mm. there is no chance that I get to the next level or build a business by working nine to five. This is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so those that want the nine to five go, what, you know, solopreneurship, as you know, is not for everybody. Right, and right. a lot of your listeners may be in a nine to five and they just want to wholesale on site. There's nothing wrong with that. Like keep the safety of the nine to five. It's only those that want to truly hustle and grind. Um, if you want work-life balance, then, you know, a solopreneur is probably not, not the best, best uh, form of action. You know, Mark, I mean, I completely agree. At least, at least when you first started out, but, it, but as long as you, as long as you continue to want to grow and scale, it's, it, it's really hard. But Mark, I got this questions that I want to ask that I don't ask a lot of people that's on the channel. Is that, does your wife, is she also like an entrepreneur as well? Or, or, or she has a different dude. So how does that work? <laughs> it, it, she trusts me. I, as, ah. as, at the end of the day, Kong, she trusts me. Um, and I don't mean this derogatorily because we've talked about it, but she has complete trust in, Mark, you take care of all the finances, you make all the decisions um you know about what we buy what we sell i mean she's just at peace now there was a time mm-hmm. here here's a good story for you okay so we're driving to the airport one day and we're we're flying to new zealand okay to go home on vacation actually my mother-in-law was driving us to the airport and luckily she was in the car with me cuz it kind of <laughs> you'll see why here i get a call from a buddy down in florida and i'm like hello he says uh, hey uh, congratulations and i'm so on on my end of the phone all my wife could hear is say i was like oh really oh that's great news Okay, yeah, we'll have to, uh, what, close in 30 days? Okay, great. Thanks, man. And I hang up. She's like, who is that? Oh, it was uh, Todd. He's down in Florida. Well, did you buy a house in Florida? Well, uh, no, I didn't buy a house in Florida, honey. <laughs> I just got one under contract. <laughs> but she's like, you bought a house without telling me? I'm like, honey, it's it was a great deal. You had know, to pounce, right? You had to get on that deal. So I literally bought a house in Florida without her knowing, which is kind of the running joke um that i would do that but obviously i could have flipped it and made money we decided to keep right. it you know as a second home and that would kind of became our second home down there and we loved it but yeah she has full trust and faith in me and i think at the end of the day kong in in true love you have to have it starts with trust and mm. we love each other she trusts me and uh she knows that i would never do anything to harm our family wow man well mark um so you're 21 year 21 years in the game Dude, yep. Lon, Lon and I've been together for 20 years. Oh wow! <laughs> so we're just uh, we're just one year shy from you, man. Yeah, that's it's special. You know, when you find that one person, um, you know, I, I root for. I was talking to uh, someone in my office the other day about like celebrity relationships, and I said, yeah. you know, I always root for the celebrity relationships right. because they were talking about like that John Krasinski or whatever his name right. from the office, and Emily Blunt, and um, mm-hmm. someone else brought up like um, another f- celebrity couple, and it's like. There's so many of the Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes and like right. all of these relationships that go bad. And and because there's so much pressure on when you're at when you're a personality and, and, and a real famous celebrity. Well, and forget that. I mean, anybody has the pressure. I just right. root for marriage, you know. Mm. I, I root for people to stay together. Yep. 
I believe that I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I believe, you know, that, that God created, created us to be with one partner and, and, you know, to, um, you know, to enjoy that and celebrate that because it's so rare these days where people will actually stay together for that long. I mean, what it, we're, we're against the odds. Isn't it like 55 or 60% of people get divorced now? Oh yeah, ab- absolutely. Now, Mark, okay. We're going to take a little turn just because you brought this up, Mark. I, I want to hear your, um, your real opinion on this. Why do you think celebrity couples often don't work out? 99.9 well, probably don't work out. Let, let me quote Chris Rock, right? Yeah. A man is only loyal as his options. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the celebrities, um, you know, fame is addictive. And I think, yeah. um, you know, the, it's, it's a drug that people are, um, you know, kind of they crave and, and they, they get pumped up. I mean, you've probably even seen it, you know, when, with your celebrity, you know, yeah. when you get recognized on the street, you can certainly, um, you know, be you know, feel like you're bigger than you really are. And, and yep. it's all ego. And you think, oh, you know, you're, I'm too good for you. Or, But I think at the end of the day, um, it's just a lack of trust and a lack of respect. Um, mm. True love is, is, I think, just where you trust each other and you forgive each other daily. I mean, we're all knuckleheads, you know, right. we're all out there just, you know, trying to mm. um, be the best version of ourselves. But when the ego gets in the way, thinking mm. that you're actually bigger, um, you know, I think that's when it, when the perspective um, gets a little warped. I see. Mark, as for me, as for me, I, as for, dude, this is not a relationship channel, by the way. But no, as for me, <laughs> how do we get down this line? <laughs> yeah, but, but Mark, but as for me, the reason why I think in the celebrity world, it doesn't usually work out and it won't last a long time is because there's just too much temptation. And, yeah. here, and here's what I mean by that. I mean, dude, I mean, like you're with somebody and then all of a sudden you play a movie you're, you're making out, you're kissing, or you, or, or you doing that scene with the other yeah. person. And, and to me, in life, there's already too much temptation, right? There's already right. too much temptation. And for you to resist the temptation itself, right, as a person, not talking about celebrity, it's already hard. But imagine if you're a celebrity and you're just, you know, listen, if, if, you're, if you're a successful dude, there's always another dude that's more successful. If you are a pretty chick, there's always another chick that's prettier than you. And when they, and I think when people, when in the celebrity world, you know, they get exposed to so much of that. It's just hard to resist the temptation, especially the, the kind of movies that, that, that they play and kind of do that. You're right. My man. Opinion. Uh, yeah, no, uh, temptation is, uh, is a very real thing. And I think it's, um, yeah, I also think, you know, we've gone so far away from just, I mean, morals and ethics have just gone yeah. way out the window. It's another discussion for a different yes. day. But um, man, society is, I just, I cringe, you know, it's not so much what people do that surprises me, but it's, it's who that does it, who does it? You know, I'm like, man, that person was doing that. That disappoints me. But. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, Malik, I, I'm going to take you back. To, <laughs> I'm going to take you back uh, to the real estate world. Now, Mark, people have asked um obviously you started in 2001 so you've been through the whole 2008 man i want you to touch on that a little bit mark so people that have never gone through uh what a recession depressions i want you to kind of give them a taste of that when 2008 hit it actually ended um a business relationship so i actually had uh, two business partners at the time um and one of them lost his job um which kind of was like it was like a three-legged stool i was all operations and we had two silent business partners when that one lost his job, it um, caused a lot of strain on that business relationship and it disbanded. Mm. So now I'm out on my own again, um, which was a good thing. I was able to kind of restructure, but now I'm out on my own. Um, the banks weren't lending to me because now that, I mean, that was the biggest thing. And that's a big, here, here's one good, good takeaway from you. The first thing that happens in a real estate downturn is that the ability to, to borrow money dries up quickly for those that are not well supported. If you don't have a ton of cash in the bank and you don't need the money, you will not get lent to. And that's the one thing that people that have not gone through 2008 won't understand because I'd flipped hundreds of houses. Mm-hmm. I had a portfolio of real estate. I was, and yet the banks were still saying, oh no, we don't lend to real estate anymore. Have you not seen the, the, the carnage out there? We don't lend on real estate. I'm like, real estate's safe. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> so it just, it doesn't allow you to scale at the same rate. So Again, wholesalers, I get it. They're, they're the middlemen, but those that are, it will impact the wholesale community because their buyers will go away. Yep. You know, I mean, they will, the, the, just the whole market will shrink and contract. So beware, the first thing to go is the ability to borrow money when the market crashes. 
but I pivoted and actually, so because of that, I started using other people's money. So mm -hmm. I would do turnkeys, but active turnkeys. So for those listening that don't know what turnkey is, a turnkey operation is just where you the the operator does everything on behalf of the investor. So I had um, pivoted to working with people internationally. So I had people from Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Hong Kong, Brazil, China, all this foreign wow. money coming in trying to buy up assets in America through my company. And I would they wouldn't even come to the country. I would just buy a house for, with their money, rehab it with their money, get it rented out, and then manage it. And I would just get paid a fee, kind of clipping the ticket all the way along the way, wow. a little bit for construction, a little bit for acquisition, a little bit for management. And so I'd kind of be a fee-based business. So as my fees grew, then I would buy, do some for myself and grow fees and then do it for yourself. So that's how I managed my way through the recession. Um, it was really just telling people, hey, real estate's on sale. Kong, here's another one for you. Why is it that in 2008, real estate's on sale? When Walmart has a sale, everyone 50% off, everyone goes rushing. Right. When real estate has a sale 50% off, they say, I would never buy real estate. Colin, yep. You must be crazy. It doesn't make sense to me. So I saw that opportunity. And that's another Warren Buffett line, right? Where he says, when there's blood in the streets, start mm. buying. So that's, that's one thing I think uh, I was wise enough to know that it was the greatest opportunity of my lifetime was to be able to be around in 2008 and buy as much as I could. So I, again, I had to make money. So I would, you know, I would basically be a turnkey provider, kind of like wholesalers. You know, I was just making fees. But then I'd take that and start investing in real estate, live on way less than what I was earning. Just really, really, uh, I was, my first apartment, I was, we were only paying like 500 bucks a month for the rent, you know? So um, it was nothing and we'd live on less than we needed. And just, I was owning more than the landlord that I was <laughs> renting from. <you> know? <laughs> but that's just the way that I kind of started clawing back into the game. Man, dude, back in 2008, um, I know a lot of people, I, uh, even one of uh, one of Lon's brother has to go through that. And I think he has to file bankruptcy because of 2008 and the way it hits. Now, Mark, how how can someone, especially people who fix and flip, and if you fix and flip on a high volume, how can they protect themselves in case if there is another crash? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, don't over lever yourself. Mm -hmm. um, don't over leverage yourself on the asset. So you know, hard money lenders are extremely um, dangerous and they are the snake that is always going to come back and bite you if you're not um, well maintained. Um, so have some private money lenders um, that were that are in the game with you. So try, you know, if I'm a fix and flipper that is using hard money and has no reserves, I would be super leery. Um, <clears throat> hard money is prevalent these days. Everyone is using it. Everyone is using hard money because there's always an exit. Yep. But, you know, a lot of smart investors out there would use a 10-10-20-20 stress test. So, oh. so, okay, let me talk to 10-10-20-20. So, Kong, what if my cost of construction went up by 10% and the after repair value on my sales price went down by 10%? Would the property still be able to be sold? What happens if my cost of construction, my rehab expenses went up by 20% and the sales price came down by 20%? That would be extreme, but would I still be able to make money? So doing some, you know, the pencil doesn't lie. Put the pencil down, um, start writing and stress testing your assets to make sure that they would stand um, even if you had a 10% correction. Wow. So now, Mark, as far as in reserve goes, because I get people that say, hey, Kong, you know what, dude, it, it, it's stupid to put money in the kit in the bank because it depreciates, dude. Your bank account should always be empty, dude. Always be, always get that money working because Uncle G said that, hey, I took all my money. And, dude, because people don't understand that you got to have reserve. The more real estate you own, the more reserve you have to get to have. So Mark, let me ask you, Mark, how much reserve should you have when you are fixing flipping property or, or owning property? Yeah. So, when, okay. Let me start with owning. So for every rental property that you own, you should have $3,000 in reserves, in my opinion. So if you own 10 rental property, you should mm. have, it, it, well, and I say that once you get to 10, you can kind of cap it. If I have 15 grand in a bank account, you know, normally the rents are coming in and you're cash flowing. So once you get to at least, you know, 10 or 15 grand in a bank account, that should be fine once you get to 10 properties, but at least 3K per property. property. So for the first you know, three or four properties, make sure you're building that nest egg. And if you're borrowing money from a friend to get started or seed capital, 
remember that part of your seed capital, part of the operation should be to have some money set aside for that worst case scenario. Um, so borrow more than you need is what I'm saying and pay a little bit more interest on the money just to have it sitting there in reserves. When you make that first wholesale check and you make 15 grand, stick five of it over here in that, and so that you can have the money ready to go when you're going to hold on to your first property. So when you're holding property, I would say at least 3K. Um, the other question on the fix and flip? Yep. Depends on the market. Like I'm not, I'm not the guy that says you have to have just a ton of money in the bank because that would limit the ability of people to jump into the game. And I'm not right. someone that's going to come on and, and say that necessarily that's the way. So it depends on the situation. If you have, if you're using all hard money, then I'd like you to have three to five grand in the bank um, above and beyond all of the expenses that it would take to get you through the rehab. Again, gotcha. in 10, 20, 20, just stress test it. Like what happens if it doesn't sell on the back end? Um, which by the way, um, if you want to talk about forecasting, we can, but I'm not a, I'm not the guy coming out here doomsday. I think we've got a long run of, of, um, you know, of, of good strength in the single family market. So I don't foresee anything. Yeah, again, I'm not a, you know, a speculator. All of our properties are sold right from the sure. get go. But for those that are speculating, I think you've got all of 2022 to, you know, to still have some good run. But yeah, I think someone that has, you know, three to five grand in the bank um, on top of all the other expenses would be a wise house flipper. Gotcha. And Mark, I think I think you just you just touched base on this. And I was just going to ask you about the current real estate market. Do you um, what's your take on it as far as in it's going to is there going to be a crash? Is it going to slow down? Is it going to keep going up? What's your thought, Mark? So the interesting thing in this compared to 2008, uh, if someone wants to go all like doom and gloom, is there's two major things that have not happened. <clears throat> well, one that's happened and one that hasn't happened. The one that hasn't happened is Lending never got as loose as it did in 2004, five, and six. I mean, clearly everyone knows. I mean, you, you've watched the big short and all these different <laughs> movies that, that talked about how loose the lending practices got where, you know, exotic dancers were making, you know, money. <laughs> they just go buy five houses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm quoting the movie, but it was pretty entertaining. Um, and clearly that was the case. I mean, you know, I think if my son, who's 15, was around at that time, he probably would have got sent a credit card application, probably would have got approved for a house, right? And he doesn't even make any money. So, um, yeah, it was extremely loose lending practices and banks have learned their lesson. They have not been loose lending practices whatsoever. Mm. Secondarily, inventory is at an all time low because of COVID-19, um, because of, uh, the, uh, restrictions of new home construction through that decade from 2010 to 2019. Here's a stat for you. Did you know that from every, the four decades prior to 2010, so that would have been the 2000s, the 90s, the 80s, and the 70s. There were at least 20 million new home starts every decade in the United States for those four decades. In the decade from 2010 to 2019, there was only 5.6 million. Oh, That's a wow. 5% drop off. So my point being from 2020, we still have to catch up. Even if we did 20 million starts this decade, we're still playing catch up. Mm. So, And that's why we only have inventory of, you know, like one month inventory on the market right now across America. So that's a big factor is there's just not enough inventory. So new home construction still needs to be ramped up to take care of the demand for housing. And then lastly, Kong, Wall Street. Like Wall Street is firmly in the single family game right now. All the funds, the syndications, the, uh, the these big buyers that are coming in and buying up single family, think about that. They are now owning, they probably own somewhere in the neighborhood of around, you know, 700,000 single family rental homes in America. And they're trying to get even more and more and more. If the market does take a slight dip of 5% or 10%, they're just going to be like, hey, we're in it for the long game. And they're going to mm. gobble that up really quickly because they feel like they're getting 10% discount. There will, I don't see a, a scenario where the market could drop by 20% because the Wall Street is going to come out and just buy all the single family stuff that they possibly can. And also from 2008, there's so many individuals like myself. I mean, there's wholesalers, real estate guys, investors. There's so many people now that understand that, if real, that real estate always wins in the end. Mm -hmm. And so everyone knows real estate ends. It's not a secret anymore like it was, I think, back in 2008. And so all those that said, Hey, real estate, as I said before, had 50% off on the, on the front door and they ran from it. Now I think people will be running to it. And so if there's a 10% drop off, I think we're going to be protected. So there's this kind of flaw, a protection layer that if the market drops, I think you're going to have a, uh, a lot more interested buyers that will come in and kind of stop it from crashing. I see. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dude, Mark, I pre dude, thank you so much for the insight, man. I'm taking a lot of notes. Now, 
Mark, let me ask you about this because I, I know that we've got a lot of people on the single family versus the multifamily, man. So what do you think is better, single family or multifamily? <laughs> <laughs> What's better, an apple or an orange? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, look, they're both great. Truly, I own both. Um, I think you have to diversify. Diversification is great. Um, Love it. Single family is an easier entry point. Um, then you get into duplexes and fourplexes, which is kind of multifamily. But I mean, it's like one to four kind of I would consider single families like one to four. I think of multifamily as like an apartment complex with like, you know, anywhere from, you know, 12 to, you know, 200 doors. Mm. Um, and that is great, but that's where you have to be savvy. And I think there's opportunities out there, but that's where you should not use your own capital. There's enough margin in the bigger deals that you should always do a syndication or a private offering or go get other people's money to be able to do those deals. If you're putting your own money into those kind of deals, I think you're um, probably playing the wrong game. Um, I think there's tons of margin and on those, on those kind of deals, um, you know, just go, attra they attract capital so quickly. It should be so easy. If the money is, if there's not money there, it's probably not a good enough deal on the multifamily side, single family, fix and flip. That's great. Hold them as rentals. That's fine. But then honestly, you build up a portfolio. Um, I'm not opposed to even just doing a 1031 exchange where you go into a bigger deal. Right. That would be when you do your own deal is when you, Hey, I've got 20 rental property. Let me sell them to a fund or sell them to one buyer and then turn around 1031 and something, something bigger. Right, man, dude. Uh, I got Mark is just so dude. I, Mark is just so sharp um, at his craft. Like I can sit here and ask him question all day long. Um, but um, so Mark, so single family, multifamily. Now I want to, I want to ask you because I know a lot of CG member, man, been talking about Airbnb. Yeah. Do you have, do you have any Airbnb and what do you think about Airbnb? <laughs> so I think COVID was the, the, the classic stress test of Airbnb and it flourished. And so that's the interesting thing is um, COVID kind of said, you know, it challenged all mean, means of um, accommodation. And I think rentals were strong because people had to stay in their homes. People have to have a roof over their heads. But hotels, surprisingly, were, um, were hit ex obviously extremely hard with a lack of travel. But even apartment complexes, the multifamily kind of struggled a little bit because people and, and they helped single family. But Airbnb single families are great, dude. They're really, really good. In fact, I was having a, I was helping a, a fellow CG member who was in my room um, at the last CG. He had reached out to me and said he wanted to talk about arbitrage because his method is that he will get long-term leases with a landlord and then just, so he doesn't even own it. He'll sign a long-term lease and then he'll arbitrage and do short-term rentals on the back end. So yeah, I have uh, just one myself down in Florida. Uh, actually, you know, my good friend, Jason Medley. And I have a big Airbnb down there. Um, and that's the other fun thing. I mean, that's a, you know, $2 million home on the water down in Florida um, that I would never be able to afford and just have it sitting there, um, you know, vacant. But now it's cash flowing. I mean, we'll, I think our gross rents will be somewhere around, you know, $230,000 a year um, in gross <laughs> rev on that, on that one Airbnb just from renting that out, you know, at around uh, 1200 a night. So. Woo! And so... so <laughs> Yeah, so Airbnb allows you, so it's kind of cool. It allows you not only to, to capitalize and buy some much cooler real estate. So I mm. kind of like, you know, buying bigger and nicer things that will appreciate in value. I couldn't have a rental, a $2 million rental property has never been an equation. In fact, I would tell people generally, if something's over $250,000, it's not going to make a good rental property. All of a sudden, Airbnb has changed the game. They've said, hey, yep. you, you can have a $2 million property, an $8 million yep. property or anything, and it's and it can be a successful rental property. So, dude, it's it's uh it's changed the game, and I'm a big believer. Dude, Mark, I bro, I'm so I'm I, I'm so glad that you say that. It's so the thing is like with Airbnb, it's just completely different uh, with long term rentals. Like you can make the number make sense, right? So we just there's a property that just pop on the market in Scottsdale or uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and we overbid. We overbid it, I think, by like 40 G's. For regular people that's going to buy and live in it, probably won't make sense. For people that yep. want to buy in the long term, probably won't make sense. But guess what? It makes sense for us because we calculate and we're going to do Airbnb on it. So the number just makes sense. Yeah, there's a there's a Facebook group out there that some of your listeners may want to go to. I think it's called Airbnb Homes for Sale. And I'm a part of that group. And the interesting thing is, like, because I was looking at buying one in, in um, Arizona and in, in Scottsdale. And so there were some opportunities down there. Um, ended up bidding on one, didn't get it. But there's, it's an interesting group because the people that don't know what they're doing, they'll come in and, and they'll, they'll, it's a, so it's a way to sell like done for you Airbnbs. Yep. 
And so um, that group is, is pretty powerful because they can come on there and, and a house that might normally retail for a million, they sell it for 1.2 because they generate enough income. It makes it a really good rental. And so they'll say, Hey, this listing is 1.2. And you can tell the rookies cause they're like, man, there's no comps on that. You know, it's going to sell for a million. And it's like, Hey, silly, silliness here. Keep in mind that it's generating some, you know, yep. a, you're not going to live there. It's going to be a rental property and B the rental property is going to be four X what you think it would be as a long-term rental. Because for short-term rentals, you can forex the uh, the total top line revenue. Dude, totally agree. And uh, I, the wife, she posted on her Instagram stories, and uh, and people will be like, "Well, you know what? Who pay who pay eight hundred dollars a night? Well, who pay twelve hundred bucks a night? Your it's like your pocket is not deep enough. Doesn't mean other people don't have a deep pocket. Hundred <laughs> percent. You'd be amazed how many people and. You know, everyone wants, I think the idea of going to, um, like, I think it's almost the bigger, the better now, because if you I might, when I want Airbnb, I want at least a four bedroom home, because mm. then you can charge, you know, north of $1,000 a night and two yep. families are going to come in there or four couples and they're going to split the cost. It's no big yep. deal. Yep, dude, I completely agree. And uh, um, I think uh, someone also asked, so Kong, I mean, aren't you nervous? Now, listen, man, because all, all, all you really need to break even, I mean, to be conservative, it, it's rented out for what 10 to 15 days right yeah. like not even uh, that i mean you'll break even everything yeah. will be covered right imagine just rent it out for 500 bucks a night all right just for 10 nights that's what it's a proven concept it's kind of yeah. like uber back in the day like everyone's like oh i don't know we don't know these people it's like no no no. now it's completely proven i would have no problem with my son just getting an uber and coming <laughs> home because you can track them and everything yep. like that Everyone understands now Airbnb is a way of life. It has completely changed the game. It is a new asset class and is absolutely vi the viability of it long term is here to stay. I think people enjoy and I enjoy staying in a home versus staying in a hotel when I'm traveling around the country. No, completely, completely agree. So now, Mark, um, as we're going to wrap this up, man, could you share kind of like where you're doing your business at? Because I know you're in a couple of different markets. Where, you, where are you doing your business at? Where are you buying? What are you looking to buy? And all of that. Dude, thank you. Um, we are in Kansas, Missouri, and Alabama. Um, currently, this year, we're on track to do somewhere in the neighborhood of around 350 to 400 deals. And um, you, the, here, hey, here's a cool stat for you, because I know you have a, a wholesale community that you appeal yeah. to. Um, dude, and you, your wholesale to millions is such a great channel. Oh. But dude, how about this? Last year, actually, for the last two years, we have paid out over a million dollars of assignment fees to wholesalers in our markets. How cool is that, dude? Dude, that is uh, cool. Literally, we, so we actually, um, we, we love wholesalers. Um, we think that they're a great way. They hustle, they grind, they door knock. They do all these different channels to bring deals to the table. Yep. And so we're just embracing that and saying, hey, we'll be your end buyer. We're professional, you know, a buyer that won't haggle you. We'll, we'll just give you our number. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But we have great repeat customers, um, wholesalers that just love coming back to us and bringing us deal flow. We share our rehab calculator with them. Um, we do all the, you know, share all of our uh, just open book and say, hey, this is what we can pay for it. And we've been able to pay these guys so much money. It's been awesome to see. Um, and so, yeah, Kansas, Missouri, and Alabama is kind of our, our primary markets there. Nice, man. Now, since Mark brought that up, I want to go into a little bit here. When you find yourself a buyer that that don't haggle about your wholesale fee, that don't a penny pinch your wholesale fee, because I, I came across one of those buyers. And let me tell you, like people at CGs, right? You bring them a deal, they're more than happy to pay you whatever it is. 100 Gs, 200 Gs. I've seen them big assignment. No yep. problem. Okay. So I actually chat with Mark offline. Um, just, I think, two, two, three days ago before we actually do this interview. And here's something that I'm planning to do um, for those of you who's watching for my NFT community. So I am launching my own NFT project um, sometime in April, could be early May, um, called TMC, the Millionaire Club. And here's what my plan is to do for the TMC NFT community, where I chat with Mark, is that I want to bring the connections of CG, which is some of the biggest buyers all across the country, all across the U.S. of A, under one roof. And then for those of you who's in the community, I'll share that multi-million dollar network with you. So you bring the deal and we'll match you up with the buyer. So Mark, let's just say you're, you're, you, you have a deal in Kansas, boom, Mark is your buyer. And he doesn't buy one or two deals a year, baby. This guy, this guy does 300 something deals a year. 
I think the biggest mistake that a, that a rookie wholesaler can make, Kong, is they overinflate the ARV, they under, yeah. you know, budget for the rehab, and they just try and force it upon a rehabber. It's like, dude, if you're wanting him to go broke, just take it easy. You know, you know, they know their numbers. Don't try and um, don't try and force it. Like, be realistic. And yep. the easier job is to just go back to the seller and tell the seller, hey, you're asking too much. You know, I mean, if it's not a deal, it's not a deal. There's enough deal. What we have found is that there's enough deal in there to pay the wholesaler a great fee for us to make some money on the back end and for the seller to be happy. And you just got to go find those deals. And that's, and that's how you create a win, win, win. Right, Mark? Got to. It's the only <laughs> way to do business, man. It's, it's the only way. You guys, we are going to wrap this up. So, Mark, how can people connect with you? Man, I appreciate you asking. I have a real estate channel um, on YouTube. And YouTube, would love. we're really pumping out some great content. I've got love a social it. media manager, Pete, uh, who's here with me today. And we're really focused on educating the public. Um, again, I know you're more wholesale focused. Yep. We are, you know, real estate investor and uh, passive income and building a real estate portfolio. So if people are nice. interested in building a real estate portfolio. It is Mistake Free Real Estate YouTube channel. That's Mistake Free Real Estate. And uh, if you want to go to mistakefreerealestate.com, um, our podcast is there also, as well as my book, Mistake Free Real Estate. So yeah, we just love some followers there. Obviously, Instagram is a great way also at Mark Delator um to uh you know to, to reach out as well i'm sure you'll put that in the comments awesome you guys i'll link all of mark um you know connections right in the bottom here and uh mark is whatever he's on camera this guy's super genuine even in person and he's such a go-giver so make sure you guys go and follow mark i mean listen he's been in the game for a long time you know what he's doing i'm sure he can certainly help you out moving through whatever it is getting you you from where you are to where you need it to be and i think every one of us are looking for that financial freedom so, Mark, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having you on, man. And I'll see you at the next CG. Thanks, Kong. Yep. Take care, Mark. So, as Mark is uh, getting off, I want to give it to you, let you guys know that. So, Mark is just one, uh, one of out of what two hundred something that are in or uh, that's in my CG, my real estate mastermind uh, uh, event called Collective Genius. So, imagine I bring two hundred plus people under one roof. Right, all these are buyers or wholesaler, and they do massive volume every single month. So you bring bring a deal, right? We'll link you up with the right CG member, boom, and get your deal sold. And that is something that I'm planning to do for uh, my TMC NFT project. That is one of the perks and the utilities that we're focused on doing. And I am going to, um, you know, work with Mark on that, and, and we're going to make it so it, it flows. Uh, it, it just flow nice and easy when you just got a deal. You post, we'll link you up and get it all done for you. So we'll do the other fifty percent of the work. So you want to find out more about my NFT project? Just go to my Discord. Also, too, is I'm open up my Discord channel uh, completely for free uh, for you to network. Just go to TMC NFT Project. Dot com. But anyways, I hope you enjoy this video because I know Mark dropped a ton of bomb. I hope you take notes. But until next time, you guys, take care and ciao.